All right, let's go ahead and open. We are in the last parable, unless I'm forgetting one, in the next couple of chapters. And uh, I'm kind of ready to be done with parables, I'll be quite truthful. Remember why he's talking in parables. It goes all the way back to chapter 13, right? Uh, in chapter 12, he said he had uh, finished the, his presentation of, his, of himself to the nation, the Lord Jesus, and they rejected him. He can't, uh, God can't use the nation of that day. And so he said he's going to have to recreate the nation of Israel, and he's going to do it through that believing remnant he's been calling out, going all the way back to the days of John the Baptist. And he's going to use them to recreate the nation. It came to that great point in Matthew 12 and 13 where he can't use the nation of that day. They've rejected him in unbelief. Uh, so he's going to recreate the nation out of this believing remnant. But he wants to give the unbelieving nation one more chance, a bona fide opportunity to receive him again. And that's going to be at Pentecost. So he talks to the, his own people uh, in parables to keep secret, keep it away from the uh, unbelieving element of the nation, but begin to reveal what God's going to do through this believing remnant. And he gave those eight parables in Matthew 13 that described the general conditions of, uh, the, uh, of what's going to happen in their ministry going forward. He learned, you learn there in the parable of the sower, the parable of the scribe, uh, God, their purpose is going to be dispersing, sowing, uh, the word of God, spreading the gospel of the kingdom, writing it down. The scribe is especially associated with writing. And you see all that happening in the gospels. Uh, in, in Pe Peter at Pentecost, uh, they wrote those things down. It's Hebrews through Revelation, they recorded everything. So that when he restarts his program with the nation of Israel, after this dispensation of grace, they're going to pick up right where they left off. They have the gospel of Matthew, the infallible proofs. Jesus is the Lord. Jesus is the Christ. They have all that material. And Hebrews through Revelation, they'll pick up and go from there. And then he tells them about uh, how during this time, let's go back now, remove the, dis oops, the dispensation of grace, how there's going to be a delay in the reception uh, in the coming of the kingdom. There's going to be a time of delay. There's going to be uh, a delay. He's not going to return right away. There's going to be a time element. And he informs them that they, during that time, in the parables of the sower, or the wheat and the tares and the good and bad fish, he explains the generation of Satan that goes all the way back to Cain that's always persecuted God's people is going to continue intermingling, coexisting with the people of God all the way to the second coming. And when he comes, and that's actually what our parable today is about. It's a good intro to our parable today. When he returns with his angels, he's going to separate the wheat from the tares, and he's going to separate the good fish from the bad fish. Then as you work your way in Matthew 13, he says the other thing that's going to be true of this time, here they are, he's giving the parables here, going all the way out through that tribulation period and then the return of Christ here. The other thing they needed to realize is that they had to operate by faith, not by sight. By sight, it, it would look uh, like it would be, they would be involved in the most insignificant and little thing in the world, in the world's eyes. Here they are. What is Peter preaching at Pentecost? He's, and what is Peter preaching at Pentecost? He's preaching a king, someone they say is king, uh, and he's crucified on a cross. Well, you know, in the world's eyes, that's about the most worthless kind of king you can have. It's insignificant. What good is a king crucified on a cross? Of course, we know he was raised from the dead. Uh, but in the world's eyes and the human's eyes, they miss that. When you get over at the end of Jesus' three-year ministry, you get into early action, you know how many people are gathered together? 120 people. That's it. That's 120 people gathered to get there. After Jesus' three-year ministry, they group together in Jerusalem. There's 120 people. It's going to look like if they go live by sight during this tribulation, they're going to be a severe persecution. They're going to be ridiculed. They're going to be uh, put under Satan's extermination. But they're going to be the least of all things 
in the world's perspective, like a grain of mustard seed. And he's going to turn it into something great, a great shrub, the nation of Israel, a great tree, the kingdom. So they need to live by faith. If they look by sight, they're going to look at the way the world looks and they're going to think it's insignificant and uh, God isn't doing anything. They need to live by sight. And he goes through that and that also the, the goodly pearls and the great pearl. And then he explains to them in Matthew 13 and those final two uh, parables, the core parables, that they need to realize Satan's going to be hiding his false teaching among them and the, in the world. But at the same time, God's hiding his treasure, his people in the world, and the idea of preserving and protecting and preserving them. So he gives those general characteristics. That's what it's going to be like from here on uh, over till the second coming of Christ. That's the, what the, what, how their ministry, that's the context in which their ministry is going to take place. So now what's going to be their next question? They're going to say, well, well, this is great. You've given us all this information, but how are we going to minister to you? When the nation is in complete ruin, the nation is under the huge debt of sin. The nation has been bankrupt by that vain religious system who stole away God's riches for the nation and used them for himself. How are we going to access those? Jesus gives two parables, Matthew 18 and Matthew 20. And he says, I'm just going to forgive the national debt. I'm going to remove the, your great debt of sin. I'm just going to forgive it. And then in Matthew 20, he says, I'm going to infuse the nation with my riches. Everything they need, their daily provision, everything they need, he's going to provide them with. So now what's their next question? Then they go, well, that's great. There's an account now for the nation of Israel. How are we going to access it? Do we go through that vain religious system? That's how we've been told to access God's riches in Israel. You go through the religious system. And Jesus says, no, I'm going to put down that vain religious system. And then we have three what we call transfer parables. He's going to transfer the things that that vain religious system stole from God and the nation, and he's going to put it in Israel's national account and fill that up with everything they're going to need to recreate the nation out of them. And then what's their next question? Well, how do we access it? And he tells them you access it by faith prayer and forgiving and then we just finished kind of it's a quick tour through the parables and then we come to the final thing he's ready he's just uh, two days till he goes to the cross here now in Matthew he's all done he's given them everything they need he's given them the national riches of Israel uh, at the cross he's going to fill up Israel's account with the riches of God New covenant blessings, kingdom blessings, blessings of the law. He's just going to fill it, fill it, 200 trillion, trillion, trillion talents of blessings. He's given them the combination to access it. And then we had three, we just finished this last week, the three parables that I called three charge parables. He's ready to go to his death. He's ready to leave them. He's going to die on that cross, be raised again, and ascend back to the Father and leave them. Of course, he's going to send the Holy Spirit. He's going to leave them personally, though. And he says, now I charge you. I've done everything you need. I've explained everything you need. Now make use of those riches. Use those riches. And these the, we had three charge parables. Use those riches to take care of my people. Use those riches to prepare the nation and ush to be ushered into my presence when I return. Make use of those riches. Whatever opportunity comes along, just go faith, prayer, uh, prayer and forgiveness. Ask and you shall receive. Take what you need. Use the opportunity. Don't bury it in the ground. Doesn't do anybody any good there. Use it. Through the, let the Spirit, the God, the Holy Spirit, use it in and through you to facilitate the rebuilding of the nation so that when I return, you'll have been uh, faithfully taking care of my people and you'll be able to usher the nation, the bride, the nation into the bridegroom's presence. And that's where we left off last week. And now we're here at this point, Christ's return. So let's go ahead and pick it up there, verse 31, Matthew 25 Verse 31, 
when the Son of God shall come in his glory. So now he's looking out ahead to the second coming. The Son of God, as the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him. Then shall he sit upon his throne of glory. He's going to sit upon his throne of glory in Jerusalem. It's going to be David's throne he's going to be sitting on. His throne of glory. He's bringing the angels with him. What did we learn uh, from our parables, the wheat of the tares and the good and bad fish? It's when he returns with his angels that the wheat is going to be separated from the tares and the good fish from the bad fish. And if we went back, we won't go back and look at those parables now. Hopefully some of you remember that the, the bad fish, the tares, are cast into the fire. And the, uh, the wheat and the good fish enter into the kingdom. And that's exactly what this parable is going to show here. So he's sitting on his throne. He's going to call for all the nations to come before him. Verse 32. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them. Now remember before this, a little earlier, and the chapter before this, he was talking about regathering his people, that believing remnant. Now he's sitting on his throne, and he's going to regather the nations. And the nations are what? They're made up of people, right? So he's going to judge the people in these nations. And they're going to, he, so he has the people, he's already regathered this believing remnant. That's one group we're going to find in this parable. Then there's another group. I guess let's read them, let's read the parable instead of me telling you. So he's gathered them all, verse 32, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. Notice, that's why I gave this the title I did, the parable of his sheep, and that's the ones that belong to him, belong to the king, uh, and the goats. Notice the change in uh, descriptive word there. It's his sheep, the goats, and he's going to divide them now. And, and he, let's see how he divides them. He'll separate his sheep. He's going to separate his sheep at the second coming, a glorious coming, when he will judge the Gentiles at the end of this tribulation period. He'll separate his uh, sheep nations from the goat nations, and it's his sheep. These are ones who have responded uh, to the believing remnant's proclamation of the gospel of the kingdom. Remember, by, by the time you get to the end of this tribulation period here, uh, the gospel of the kingdom is going to be uh, proclaimed throughout the whole world. And here you have Gentiles uh, who are going to be described a little later as righteous, who are, are going to respond to God, uh, and they believe the gospel of the kingdom. The believing remnant came and preached it to them. They believed it, just like Abraham thousands of years before. Uh, they believed the gospel of the kingdom. Uh, God counted their faith for righteousness, and they're justified unto eternal life before God and his tribunal. Forevermore, eternally secure. They belong to God. They're his sheep. The ones on the left are the goats. They're the ones who heard that same message but rejected it in unbelief. And let's watch as we find these paths. So we have three groups. Uh, you don't know about the believing remnant, uh, the brethren, until a little bit later. So I'll just tell you up front. Uh, the, you got the sheep, his sheep on the right, the goats on the left, and in the between you have the believing remnant. Now let's just follow it through now. Uh, verse 33, and he shall set the sheep on his right hand and the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So now he's talking to these gen believing Gentiles and he's uh, bringing them in. I guess we'll go back here to this. He's uh, is a, the second coming. He's divided out. He's pulled out his people versus the goats, the unbelievers, and he's, they're going to usher into that kingdom along with that believing remnant. And look at one of the key phrases. This is one of the key phrases in your whole Bible. If you get this key phrase, 
the Bible uh, will just become so much more understandable to you. This key phrase here is so important to understanding God's word for today. Uh, it takes a little bit of thought, but I can't imagine uh, anything is more important than understanding God's word for today. And here's the phrase. Look at the phrase how this ends, verse 34. He says, for the Father inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. He's talking about something here that God prepared for them from the foundation of the world, from the creation of the world. Something that God re began revealing at the creation of the world. Now you say, well, why is that such an important phrase? That is an important phrase because, go back to Luke, well I guess go ahead to Luke. I just want to show you this. This is the most important thing. I'd say this is, in my estimation, the second most important thing you can know about your Bible. Go over to Luke 1. Remember, from the foundation of the earth. Go over to Luke 1. Here we have the incarnation. Jesus is about ready to come on the scene. Uh, this is Zacharias, who is John the Baptist's father. And he is prophesying now through the Holy Spirit. And this is what he says. Uh, look, I guess we could begin at verse 67. And his father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. He hath visited and redeemed his people. And he's talking about Jesus, not just John the Baptist, but Jesus. He's redeemed his people. He's come now. Jesus has arrived on the scene. And he raised a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. And this is verse 70 is the one really key one here. This is the incarnation. Jesus is about to be born in the world. He's uh, Zacharias is prophesying. He's going to be the savior of Israel, the redeemer of Israel, the deliverer of Israel. And he says, all of this, verse 70, is in accord with what God had spoken about by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began. That's that same phrase as from the foundation of the world. There's a body of truth that began with the creation of the earth that's ultimate goal is this kingdom. That's why nothing, be, even though uh, religious systems and theological systems uh, say something new began in the gospels, meaning Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, with the incarnation of Christ, I guess to be even more specific, uh, uh, Zacharias and Luke say, no, that isn't the case. What's happening when Christ arrived on the scene is something he's been talking about since the world began. Nothing new began in the Gospels. It's not, you won't find the beginning of the church, the body of Christ in the Gospels. What you're going to find in the Gospels, as we've been seeing in Matthew, is a reference to this kingdom and what God had spoken about since the world began. Nothing new is beginning. And so now you get another big school of theology, and they say, well, nothing new began in the Gospels. It began in Acts 2. It began at Pentecost. That's when something new began. The church began, the church, the body of Christ, began at Pentecost. So let's go see what Peter says. Are you going to believe man and men and man-centered religious and man-oriented theological systems who will twist God's word to fit their theology? Or are you going to listen to God? Namely, Peter. How does Peter, does Peter say something new began at Pentecost? Go to Acts 3. Here we are at Pentecost. Acts 3. And look what Peter says here at Pentecost. He's been preaching now at Pentecost. And uh, verse, I guess we could begin at verse 20. Acts 3, verse 20. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. So now Jesus has ascended. That happened at the beginning of Acts. And now they're waiting for his return. For, uh, to return. Uh, verse 21. Whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken about by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. 
nothing new began at Pentecost. Peter's, uh, Peter's preaching is still have to do what Zacharias was talking about at the beginning of the Gospels and what has to do with what God had spoken about since the world began that culminates in this earthly kingdom. So now you, get, you run into something that's extremely critical to see. You go to the uh, Zacharias, Christ's earthly ministry, the ministry of Peter and the Twelve, all had to do with what the prophets have been speaking about since the world began, culminating in that earthly kingdom. But now what about Paul? Let's just take what Paul says. Think remembering what Zacharias said, remembering what Peter said, when it's really not, it's really not Zacharias and Peter, is it? It's the God, the Holy Spirit said it. Now God, the Holy Spirit's going to say something through Paul. And you can accept it or reject it. That's your choice. Go to Romans 16, 25. Zacharias prophesying through the Holy Spirit said so what was happening at the coming, first coming of Christ, his earthly ministry in the gospel accounts, was a fulfillment of what the prophets have been speaking about since the world began. Peter is still talking about, and when he, Pentecost, after the death and resurrection and ascension of Christ, he's still talking about what God had spoken about since the world began. But now look how the Holy Spirit describes Paul's preaching. Romans 16, 25. Now to him that is a power to establish you according to my, Paul's gospel, and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, and get this phrase, which had been, which was kept secret since the world began. That's, you understand that distinction between what was spoken in your Bible since the world began and what's in your Bible that had been kept secret since the world began. And your whole Bible is going to open up. It's not just going to be a mishmash of nonsense. You, can, you to twist and make it mean whatever you want it to mean. That is where all the change happens. Paul is revealing this mystery program, something that had been kept secret since the world began. Zacharias. Jesus in his earthly ministry, John the Baptist, Peter and the Twelve, uh, they are all have to do with what God has been speaking about since the world began. Paul explains something God had kept secret since the world began. Very critical phrase. Uh, it's the difference between, I personally believe, difference between understanding your Bible and not really being able to use your Bible at all. Let's go ahead and begin, go back to Matthew 25, and let's see how they're going to uh, do this. Matthew 25, verse 33. So he's got this, he's divided them out, he's put them in uh, separate categories here. It's his sheep, uh, there, and it's the goats. And look how he's going to operate. How is he going to distinguish between them? How is he going to treat them? Is he going to treat them on the basis of the riches of grace that Paul talks about, whereby God blesses his enemies? It's all part of the rightly dividing. Is that how what he's going to do? No. He's going to operate on the basis of the Abrahamic covenant. And maybe it'd be good before we read the next section. Let's go to the Abrahamic covenant and really the first uh, promises of that Abrahamic covenant before they were codified in the Abrahamic covenant itself. That's in Genesis 12. Go to Genesis 12. These are the promises God made to Abraham that he'll later, in Genesis 15, codify in the Abrahamic covenant. But let's just see what it says here. How are they, how is he going to regulate entrance into that kingdom? Verse 2, Genesis 12, verse 2. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and I will make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And here's the key verse, verse 3 for our, our parable in Matthew 25. I will bless them that bless thee, 
and curse him that curses thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. He's going to distinguish between them, but he'll bless those that blessed him and the, his people. He'll curse those that cursed him and his people. That's why it is so, uh, so errant to think that today we're under the Abrahamic covenant. To do what God's doing today, there's not enough grace in the Abrahamic covenant for God to do what he's doing today. The Abrahamic covenant says, I will bless those that bless you and curse those that curse you. Let's put a little different phraseology. I will bless my, my friends and I will curse my enemies. That's the Abrahamic covenant. That's the grace in that Abrahamic covenant. What's Paul say God's doing today? Is he blessing his friends and cursing his enemies? No. Today, Paul makes the great point. He's not to operate according to the Abrahamic covenant. There's not enough grace in that Abrahamic covenant because today God is blessing his enemies because he has no friends. Today, it's the riches of grace. It's not the Abrahamic covenant. Today, he's operating way beyond that. The the Abrahamic covenant just said, I'll bless those that bless you. I'll bless my friends and curse my enemies. Paul says what God's doing today, he's blessing his enemies. Ungodly sinners on enemy status before him. Romans 5, Romans 3, Ephesians 1 to 3. And because he has no friends today. The whole world joined together way back at the rejection of Christ. Jew and Gentile alike, and they all came out and uh, rebelled against God and rejecting his son. The whole world. And right at the point when, according to Peter and the Twelve, Christ should have returned and destroyed his enemies. Beginning with Saul our apostle Paul, and going to the, and then to the nation of Israel, and especially the Gentiles. Instead, Christ returned and did something Peter and the Twelve didn't know anything about. He raised up his worst enemy, saved his worst enemy, the leader of his enemies, and sent him out with grace and peace to his enemies. Beginning with Saul, he made him our apostle Paul, And then uh, first to the Jew, but especially the Gentiles. What Paul's ministry is, is the exact opposite of what Peter and the Twelve were looking for. So now, when they're going to operate according to this Abrahamic covenant for for entrance into the kingdom, let's see, read the rest of it. Now, with that little bit of background, uh, everything else should pretty much fall in place. Verse 35. For uh, I was hungered, and ye gave me meat. You get, ye gave me meat. I was thirsty. He's talking about the sheep now. And I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee hungry, and fed thee thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we you sick uh, or in prison and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as you have done it to one of the least of these. Now we get our third group. He talked about the sheep. He talked about the goats. Now he is one who does the least uh, to the least one of these. There's a third group here. You don't hear about it at the beginning of the parable, but there's a third group here. The brethren, the believing remnant. And he says, the least of one of these, uh, ye have done it unto me. You have done it unto me. That's the, how the Abrahamic covenant works. That's what brings that about. The sheep people will enter the kingdom uh, fulfilling God's prophetic program for the earth through the nation of Israel, which he'd been speaking about since the world began, uh, and that culminates in that long prophesied, long anticipated, longed for kingdom on earth. Going all the way back to Adam, what God originally wanted to do with that garden and establish on the earth is now going to be fulfilled. 
in that kingdom. They will enter in accord with the Abrahamic covenant, again, not according to the riches of grace we have today, uh, whereby God blesses his enemy. He, they're receiving blessings uh, because they have blessed Christ. And how did they bless Christ? By blessing uh, one of his people, member of that believing remnant. And remember, this believe, why is that so important? Because this believing remnant's going to be going through this great and terrible day of the Lord when Satan's uh, policy of evil against Israel and especially the believing remnant of Israel, that true Israel in God's sight, when they're going to come and uh, suffer the worst persecutions, which is the worst time, Satan's extermination policy, they're going to try and get rid of that believing remnant because if they, he can get rid of that believing remnant, it ends all this. There's not this. This will be his instead of Christ. So, they, so now you have Gentiles, this believing remnant, went out into the Gentile world, proclaimed the gospel of the kingdom. They believed it. God counted their faith for righteousness. They were participating in faith righteousness. They're connected to God in a right relationship. And now God could work in and through them to assist in the taking care and the helping of his own people. Notice these people didn't know what they were doing. It's God working in and through them. They didn't know. They were just helping. They were helping the ones that gave them the gospel of the kingdom, uh, brought them into faith righteousness, and they were assisting them. And then it becomes evident at the judgment they were helping Christ to help the least one of these as they go through this terrible, great and terrible day of the Lord, uh, under especially those last three and a half years under that persecution in difficult times, uh, they would have helped with that. But now what about the other ones? What about the other ones? Let's go and pick it up at verse 41. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire. Uh, that's a key thing also in, in Matthew, is to uh, separate uh, when from... Judgment with regard to unfaithful believers and judgment for unbelievers, re Christ rejectors. Whenever the judgment is against an unbeliever, there's always a reference to everlasting fire, lake of fire, fire unquenchable fire, all that kind of stuff. And uh, in, when it comes to the believers, because uh, okay, so there's going to be some unfaithful believers going through this tribulation period, uh, they're still going to have a right relationship with God through the Christ and his cross work, but they're not going to, either they're not going to be allowed to enter the kingdom, uh, and they're going to suffer the fate of the, the Satan's generation put to physical death, not spiritual death, but physical death, and they won't be able to uh, experience that kingdom, or they'll enter the kingdom and they go to outer darkness, out living among the Gentiles. And, uh, well, well, I was going to go into an Old Testament passage that shows us. Maybe we'll get to it yet. But let's just finish up this passage first uh, as we deal with this. So this is everlasting fire. This is, uh, you see, there's no darkness in a, in a pit of everlasting fire. It's probably pretty bright. Uh, and they're thrown in to everlasting fire. These are the unbelievers. And what did they do? Uh, they were in this everlasting fire was prepared for the devil and his angels. It wasn't even prepared for men, but that's where they're going to end up. For I was hungered, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you took me not in. Naked, and you clothed me not sick, and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we hungry and thirsty, or a stranger, and naked, sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily, I say unto you, inasmuch as you did it to, not to one of the least of these, here we have the believing remnant again, ye did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting uh, punishment, tied into that everlasting fire he just mentioned, uh, but the righteous into life eternal. They'll enter into that kingdom where they'll live out their eternal life in their everlasting kingdom. 
It's a thousand year millennial kingdom, but remember it's recreated, it's gonna go on forever. It's an everlasting covenant, a new covenant, an everlasting kingdom, an everlasting throne of David, and those who enter here will experience their everlasting life in the kingdom. Those who responded negatively, those who responded, uh, or those who responded positively to the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom and faith would help those who brought them that message. That's that believing remnant uh, by which they had helped the Lord. God counted their faith for righteousness unto eternal life. That's verse 46. Notice it says, but the righteous into eternal life. Uh, they believed the gospel. God counts their faith for righteousness. This allowed God to work in and through them for the benefit of his people, uh, which brought them under the blessings of that Abrahamic covenant. And he says, welcome to the kingdom. Enter the kingdom. For those who rejected the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom of by the believing remnant and unbelief and ignored or assisted in Satan's policy of extermination against them during the great and terrible day, the tribulation period, uh, they, which brings them under the curses of the Abrahamic covenant, and they will be cast into everlasting fire that is prepared for the devil. And there we have it. That's what we would be we're going all the way. Remember what John said way back in Matthew 3? He told the Pharisees they were heading toward the fiery judgment. And now we come to all the way to the end. We've been through the parables. We've been through all that. And here we are at the second coming. And we have the long-awaited separation. Uh, he's going to do away with the, uh, with the vain religious system. There's going to be purged. The nation of Israel, the believing remnant, the nation of Israel is going to be purged of all unbelievers. At the end, at this judgment, and we're going to end, the believing remnant's going to enter, and the friendly Gentiles are going to enter. And they're going to be the ones who re, are going to populate the kingdom at that point. It's all going to enter. Either, everybody that enters is going to be righteous. Uh, but of course, uh, they still have a sin nature. They're going to bear children during this thousand year reign. And those children, there's going to be some of those children that rebel. Uh, at the end of the thousand years, Satan's going to be released from the bottomless pit, and he's going to come have one last go at everything. And there's going to be, evidently, there's a lot of people that follow him at the end of that kingdom, millennial kingdom. Uh, so I thought it would be a good idea to maybe look at some of the characteristics uh, of this kingdom, just as kind of, I put some verses here. Uh, we won't go and look at all of them. We might look at some of them. But let's just look at some of the characteristics. It's worth noting, what is this kingdom we keep talking about? Uh, first, you need to realize it's an earthly kingdom. It's uh, the long prophesied earthly kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, as Matthew says, the kingdom of God on earth. It comes to earth. He brings it to the earth. It's established on the earth. And this is what it's going to look like. Uh, I just... And I, I started, I thought I'd try and put something together here in some kind of order, but I just, there really is no order. I just kind of listed out some things here. So just to get you some understanding of what this kingdom is going to look like and what they're going to, why they've been waiting so long for it, why it's been such a great promise. Here are some characteristics of it. And uh, all of these I think I've put references to. I'm not going to, we're not going to turn to all of them here, but maybe that would be a good study uh, for your own Bible study during the week. So the first one I have here is the unrighteous generation of Satan that lives at that time will be destroyed and cast into the lake of fire. That's what we just read about. That generation that he's just talked about a couple chapters before that, where he includes the vain religious system of his day, and it goes back to the, their fathers who persecuted the prophets in the days of, of in hist Israel's history. And then he goes all the way back to Cain and Abel at the beginning. That whole satanic generation of un, those who have rejected God in unbelief and persecuted his people that's been winding through history all the way to the end here. Let's go back to our, I like my timeline. All the way back to the end, it's finally going to be purged from the world and be thrown in the lake of fire that was for the demons 
or the devils. Uh, and the Satan's going to end up there too, but uh, God has, at the, as I just said, at the end of that millennium, he's got one more thing for Satan to do, so he throws him in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. Then he's going to come and do that. But during that thousand years, uh, with the, with the, it, entrance into that kingdom, it's going to be established, purged of Satan. If Satan's going to be bound, cast in the bottomless pit, and all his generation, everything he's worked on, everything he's produced is going to be purged and removed. Satan will be bound and cast into the bottomless pit for a thousand years. Uh, we kind of include that in the last one. God's true Israel will be regathered. We kind of just read that in the parable here. He's talking about the separation of the, his sheep and the goats, and it all has reference in, according to the Abrahamic covenant and how they treat it the members of the believing remnant. I will bless them that bless you. I will curse them that curse you. And they enter that kingdom. And he's going to regather and establish uh, God's true Israel, that believing remnant. And he's going to establish them in the land of Israel. He's going to take the people he creates in that tribulation period. He's going to usher them into the kingdom, plant them in the real, actual, physical land of Israel. And they're going to become that great nation. He's going to create from them the great nation. And that nation is going to grow and rule through the nation of Israel. He will dispense his blessings to the whole world. The kingdom. Christ rules from David's throne in Jerusalem. Here we have the king. Uh, the kingdom of heaven is set up. And there's the king ruling on his throne. Christ is going to be the ruler of the earth. Uh, and he's going to rule from Jerusalem. That extends over the whole earth in righteousness and peace. And maybe we'll, we'll look up a couple of these. Let's go back. Let's look at Psalm 72. Psalm 72. Psalm 72. Uh, he, he, we can look at the first verse. We're going to go over to verse 7 and 8. Uh, Give the king thy judgment. So this is what the king is talking about. O God, in thy righteousness unto the king's son. Verse 7. In his days shall the righteous flourish an abundance of peace so long as the moon endureth. He shall have dominion also from sea to sea, from river unto the ends of the earth. They that dwell in the wilderness shall bow before him, and his enemies shall lick the dust and go and carry on there. All enemies are going to be subdued. God's uh, Christ's reign is going to cover the earth. His righteousness is going to cover the earth. It's going to be a time of righteousness and peace. Uh, and we can look at all kinds of other, um, other examples of that. I have a whole list of verses there. Uh, we'll go on. Let's look at some more on this list, though. The other one we will look at is, oops, the Beatitudes, the blessings. If we want to stick in Matthew, go back to Matthew 5. And remember those Beatitudes? I know it seems a long time now. Probably most of you didn't think you'd still be around when we got to Matthew 25 and 26, but here we are. Uh, I was wondering if I'd be around still. So let's go to, back to Matthew 5. Remember these Beatitudes? These are all going to be fulfilled at this time. Verse 3, Matthew 5, verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So the poor in spirit, all that, they're all going to be re, uh, recover in that, re, be restored in that kingdom. Blessed are they that mourn. Those who are mourning, uh, they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, the followers of the low and meekly Jesus. They, they shall inherit the earth. They're going to inherit the earth. That's who's going to be ruling things. Remember, uh, Matthew keeps making that point. It's the least are going to be the greatest in the kingdom. The least, according to the world standards, are going to be the greatest in the kingdom. It's going to be the mild, the meek, uh, the mournful, who are mourning during this time of persecution. Blessed are they, verse 6, which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. Uh, they shall be filled. We just looked at how that kingdom's going to overflow with the righteousness of God. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, 
those who are operating on the basis of faith, for they shall see God. Uh, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Christ is going to be with them in that kingdom. They're going to see him on his throne. And his righteousness is going to cover the earth. His peace is going to cover the earth. The Holy Spirit uh, will be poured out uh, to cause people to do God's will uh, that allows for complete obedience. Of course, we've been seeing foretastes of that. He's been given a foretaste with that at Pentecost, a of even a bigger foretaste of that uh, in the tribulation period, but it reaches its fulfillment. See, he, they're not going in this kingdom expected to, through the power of their own flesh, uh, carry out the Mosaic law. That's what they tried to do for 15 years, 1,500 years from Sinai. And it was a complete failure. God's done with that experiment. They're going to enter and they're going to have this new covenant that's going to put the purified law in their hearts and the Spirit's going to cause them to do it. He's going to do it for them. What they should have said back at Sinai is like, that's a great law, but you're going to have to do it for us. We can't do it ourselves. And they, instead, they said, we will do it. They are at Christ's second coming. They're going to look on the one they pierce, fall on his grace, and say, you have to do it for us. And he's going to bring them into that new covenant blessing, put the law in their heart, and give them the spirit, and he's going to do it for them. And allowing for perfect obedience in that kingdom. God's righteousness, justice, and peace will, uh, will reign uh, Isaiah 60 would be a good one. We could look at this one. we got a few minutes here. Go to Isaiah 60. It's a good overall uh, passage on this. Isaiah 60, God's righteousness, peace, and ju uh, justice and peace will reign. Let's just read a few verses here. This brings out the darkness concept in Matthew. I think it's pretty important to see. Uh, look at verse 1. We'll just be begin at verse 1. Remember when in Matthew when we're reading about unfaithful uh, servants of Christ uh, being sent into outer darkness? Here's, here's an example of what, the, what it's talking about. This is what it's talking about in the kingdom. Now we're in the kingdom in, in Isaiah 60. Arise, shine, for thy light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. It's talking about out here at this kingdom. At the return of Christ, he establishes that kingdom. God's light is going to disperse through the world from, that, from, uh, from Israel. Let's keep reading here, verse 2. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, the gross darkness, the people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be, a seen, uh, shall be seen upon thee, and the Gentiles shall come to thy light. Out there in that Gentile realm is the darkness, and that's the big uh, problem for Israel in our Matthew and our gospel accounts, is in that fifth course of punishment, that darkness, Israel is supposed to be the light, and that fifth course of punishment, because of their rebellion against God uh, and rejection of his word, that fifth course of punishment, the Assyrians came and brought darkness to Galilee, the northern part of Israel, that's why Jesus goes to Galilee first, because they experienced the darkness first. Gentile rule. And then the Babylon, Babylonians came, and they brought the darkness and covered all of Israel. Israel's in dark. The whole world's in darkness. But a rise, a light, a Christ's second coming, he's going to, and, and his establishment of that kingdom and reigning in that kingdom is going to bring light, his light, it's going to be in Jerusalem, and it's going to be in Israel. And from there, it's going to diffuse out to the Gentile world. It's all darkness out there, and he's going to bring them. Look what the Gentiles do. Uh, they, they, verse 3, and the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. They're going to come from out in the darkness, and they're coming to Israel, coming to Jerusalem, coming to the king. For his, their light. Lift up thine eyes, verse 4, round about and see. All they gather themselves together, they come to thee. Thy son shall come from afar, and thy daughter shall be nursed at thy side. Thou shalt see and flow together, and thine heart shall fear and be enlarged. 
because the abundance of the sea shall be converted unto thee, Israel, for the forces of the Gentiles shall come unto thee. The multitude, again, he just goes on and on to describe. Uh, and that's a great chapter for reading about this kingdom from more from the uh, Gentile response. They're going to come out of the darkness and come down to Israel for their light that comes from the king sitting on David's throne in Jerusalem. Let's, let's think, talk about a couple of these other ones. We'll run through these. Satan's lie will be replaced with God's truth. Uh, we can, all, uh, we can look, also look uh, at that as a very important thing because, uh, especially if we look at the next one too, Israel will be a holy nation and a kingdom of priests who take God's holiness out to the Gentiles. This is another important thing. When you understand those courses of punishment, you understand what he's talking about here. What was the courses of punishment? Those Gentile nations covered Israel with darkness and carried off Israel, the Israelites from the land. Took them, the Assyrians scattered them out in the world and the Babylonians took them back to Babylon, removed them from the land. And uh, they were supposed to be a light. We just read that in Isaiah 60. They were supposed to be a light to the Gentiles. They were supposed to be the source of God's truth and righteousness and holiness to the Gentiles. But what, what did they become to the Gentiles? And here I think we have to go back to Paul. Or not back to Paul, ahead to Paul. Go to Romans 2. Keep your finger here. Go to Romans 2. Paul talks about the predicament of the nation of Israel. Romans 2. Now let's just look at this real fast. We read from Isaiah 60 what Israel is supposed to be to the Gentiles. What he designed her to be all the way back to Sinai. In Exodus 19, I think it's verse 6, he tells you that you should be a holy nation, a nation of priests, a holy people. But look, and they were supposed to be a light to the Gentiles. That's the ultimate goal. But look at when uh, their rebellion, what predicament this got them into. Look at Romans 2, verse 23. Romans 2, verse 23. That thou makest thy boast of the law through breaking the law, dishonorous God. The reason why they, they were under the courses of punishment is because they broke the law and were rebellious against God. And he says, verse 24, for the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. The name of the Lord is blasphemed. So that's the very opposite of what Israel was supposed to be doing. They were supposed to be shining the light of God, bringing the Gentiles to God. Before Sinai, remember those 40 or so days on the way from Goshen and Egypt to Sinai? Before they entered into that covenant, covenant with God to do the Mosaic law based on the power of their own flesh, before that, just before that, what was going up on the mountain? What was happening on the mountain? The Midianites, the Gentiles, were worshiping together with the Jews, fellowshipping together and worshiping on that mountain. Before the law, before Sinai, before all that, God had already turned them into his people, a light to the Gentiles just because he carried them along on his wings, as eagle's wings, and brought them to himself. And that's what it's going to work like in that kingdom. They're going to be a light to the Gentiles, the source of God's blessings to the Gentiles. There's going to be a removal of the curse of the fall for all creation. Uh, most of us are familiar with these verses, you know, the whole lamb will lay, lie down with the lion or and tight tiger or something you all know those ones and the vegetation will grow like crazy there will be super abundance uh, super abundance in the natural realm Rem and not only that that's for the whole creation but there also be removal of the curses of the law for Israel why was Israel suffering under all these things in the days of Jesus and the, under these courses of punishment it wasn't primarily the curses of the fall it was because of the curses of the law they were experienced. If you do these things, I won't put on you the diseases of Egypt and the diseases of the Gentiles. If you don't do them, then you receive the diseases of Egypt and the diseases of, of the Gentiles. 
the curses of the law will be removed for Israel and the curses of the fall will be removed for all of creation. And it will result in Israel uh, in healing, spiritual, economic, the shalom, I guess you could summarize all of this, spiritual, economic, physical, social, uh, personal pri uh, prosperity, all that. Remember how the Gospel of Matthew began? Chapter 4, the nation's in complete ruin. There's no shalom in the land. There's no well-being. There's spiritual darkness. Uh, dark, ruled by Gentiles under satanic control. There's sickness and illness. And there's devils in the land of Israel. All that's going to be gone. All there's going to be shalom in Israel. And it's going to be dispersed throughout the whole world. All right. I think we'll go ahead and end there. I will, I'll let you, you can look at this in the past, uh, just kind of mention it briefly. I was going to go back to Matthew 5 and just remind us. We looked at the characteristics of the kingdom. Uh, this is more the people of the kingdom. And just remember from back in Matthew 5 and 6, what he gives those little vignettes, those little video clips of what people in the kingdom are going to be doing. They're going to be jumping out of bed in the morning, alleviating anger and reconciling with friend and foe alike as though their lives depended on it. They're going to be jumping out of bed in the morning, doing whatever they can to alleviate lust so that divorce isn't even required and adultery doesn't happen. They're going to jump out of bed in the morning and they're going to, the first thing on their mind is uh, they're not going to say any oaths because what they say on the outside is what they think and believe and is true on the inside. And they'll love Remember this at the end of chapter 5 in Matthew? They'll uh, love the other as themselves, friend and foe alike. That's what the people of the kingdom are going to look like. That's how they're going to act. And so with all that in mind, we've reached that point now. Now this whole thing is going to end in chapter 26. It really begins something that's not really different. It's a continuation. We're going on to the next day here. Uh, and But now we're just... Uh, within hours of his death on the cross. And now chapters 26, 27, 28, he's not so going to be really giving sermons to the 12 anymore. He's not really uh, going to be teaching them so much as much as he'll be interacting with them. But now it's going to be all about his death on that cross and resurrection. So let's close with a word of prayer.